Journalists report on the story that God speaks, truth that he eloquently authors, circumstances he sovereignly holds, movements of nations he gently guides, economies he providentially sustains, beauty he thoughtfully creates, messes he mysteriously allows to play out, and all of the many glories of a physical universe that he so graciously made and maintains. That is what again and again and again we talk about here at New Hope. It's what we as Christians believe, right? That mysteriously and sovereignly and providentially and alongside and through our human free will, God is holding all of this and writing all of this and moving this all somewhere. He is before all things, and in in him all things hold together. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Wealth and honor come from you, God. You are the ruler of all things, and in your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. You establish the earth and it endures. Your laws endure to this day for all things serve you. And then God in first person through the prophet Isaiah, I am the one who created you. I am the Lord, the creator of all things. I alone stretch out the heavens. When I made the earth, no one helped me. For from him and through him and for him, are all things. Behold, I am making all things new. And then in the sphere of journalism, he says to John, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And so, when a journalist writes things down, like John did in the book of Revelation, and the prophets did, and all the Bible writers did, speaking truth to power, telling an amazing story, human interest story of reconciliation, exposing what is hidden or corrupt, sharing something that's new, revealing something about the profound nature of the reality of the world, the universe within which we live, sociological, political, physical, or metaphysical reality, whenever a journalist writes down the truth, they are writing down God's truth. And when they get the truth right in their articulating of their story, I believe there is something of God's story to be known through their words. So renowned theologian Karl Barth was right when he counseled us to Take your Bible and take your newspaper and read both. Adding this caveat, but interpret newspapers from your Bible. So do you do this? Drop that thought that I don't even read newspapers anymore. I read it all online. You do the math. You're smart. Do you listen for God's word in the news that you take in? Look for his providential hand holding world events. Try to seek his face in all things. So for the past couple of weeks, I've been dialoguing with four journalists. Nathan Vanderclip, the Asia correspondent for the Globe and Mail, who's in Beijing. Elizabeth Renzetti, who is in Toronto and a columnist for the same paper. Maya Willis, who is a producer for CTV in Edmonton. And Mike Zabo, who is a writer, reporter for Writers in London, England. I just love that a sermon comes together that way. I have the best job reporting on reporters in the world. Talk to them and hear their stories and kind of exegete their vocations and try to get a grasp on how they uniquely, in what they do, image God. How they report on and reflect their maker through their journalistic passions. And my hope was, looking through them, 
to gain a greater, a more full, a more life-filling understanding of who God is and how he moves in our world, what he's saying, how he sees the world, how he sees me, us. Gaia Willis, the reporter from C- or the producer from CTV in Edmonton, we first met when she called me about a month ago and said we're doing a panel discussion about Christians and politics and can Christians even be politicians and so I was the designate pastor guy and we did a little interview and that was fun. Watched on CTV 2 by nobody. Um, <laughs> anyway, we first met then and I knew that we were going to be preaching on a reporter so I said, yeah guy, I'll do that and hey, I'm doing a sermon on a journalist. Would you be interested in helping me with that? And she was very intrigued to do that. So for all of these journalists, I asked them, what do you love? What's at the core of your passion of being a journalist? And this is her response. I get to call up complete strangers and ask them to tell me about themselves. Other people are the most interesting thing in the world, but it can be intrusive to ask a stranger to open up to you. I've had the great privilege, for example, of asking grieving parents to tell me about their extraordinary daughter who had died before her 30th birthday of aggressive breast cancer. I got to ask a man who lost both arms up to the shoulder to show me how he brushes his hair and puts on his socks and how he keeps going day to day without succumbing to sadness and despair. I got to have dinner with a couple who'd finally brought home their little boy from Haiti after the terrifying earthquake made them fear they'd lost him right at the end of the adoption process. In many of these situations, it's safe to say I was asking some questions even the, my interview subject's closest friends and family might have hesitated to ask. But it was my job to be bold and ask difficult questions, so I dove in and did it in spite of myself. And in the end, I would often leave interviews feeling so connected to the people I'd talked to and lucky to be their storyteller. I do fewer personal interviews at this stage in my career, but it's still pretty great to call someone up and basically say, hey, you know that thing you're most passionate about, that you've devoted years of your life to? Tell me all about that, and let me help you tell other people all about it, too. Because your life's work, expertise, personal experience are worthy of being shouted from the rooftops. People need to know what you think, I'm constantly talking to new, interesting people and learning new things. And that means my own horizons are always expanding. And that's the best thing about what I do. First off, is she not awesome? Like, who wouldn't want to be interviewed by her? And as I read that answer and others, so reflective in many ways of the heart of God. I mean, surely God thinks that people even the most ordinary people, are the most interesting thing in the world. You're his. He made you. You belong to God. For all we know, he loves telling your story in real time as you're living it out in this one mortal life that he's given you as he narrates you. There's there's this delight and this joy in the heart of God like a good reporter has reporting a good story. And surely he's interested in what you're passionate about and wants you and your story and your life and what's important and true there to be heard, to be spoken, to have impact. Because your, your work and your expertise and your personal experience are worthy of being shouted from the rooftops. Amen, say all the angels. Because your story belongs to God, he wrote, is writing you. You're his. And so even if you're not a front page, if it bleeds, it leads, huge world global discovery kind of story, even if your story is soft news, It's still news, and it's still written by your maker, by God. Gaia kept defending a few times in her response. Yeah, but I just do soft news. I don't do the investigative journalism or the... I think all, every single story matters to God. 
and each and every one of you. Jesus said, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, yet not one of them is forgotten by God? Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. The Bible is filled with everyday stories of ordinary people that become extraordinary stories that made it into the Bible because they were spoken by God, and people knew it. So when Gaia or any other reporter gets to the true nature of a thing, the essence of a story, and eloquently names it for what it is, she is very close to what the Spirit is authoring and saying through that story, event, or thing. I wrote back to her and said, wrote back to her and said, I think reporters are akin to prophets in the Bible. Prophets told the future about things. People always think that's all they did, but more so they spoke about reality and kind of named reality for what it was. And insofar that as you do that as a producer and write stories that do that, I think there's a prophetic element to what you do. And I, I went on to write, I said, in, in the Bible, prophetic truth takes all kinds of forms, creation stories and battle narratives and ordinary sojourns of people like Abraham and poetry and parable. God prophetically speaks through poetry, soft news, art. She thought that was pretty cool. Anytime anybody accurately accounts for the true nature of things, they are in a real way, and this is all of us now, when we name truth, being prophetic. And doing it eloquently, I discovered from all four of these reporters, is hugely important to each of them. Gaia said, when I get it right and a story comes together and depicts, it, does it right, a, a, a television story, she says, I get goosebumps. And it made me wonder if Isaiah got goosebumps as he was writing Isaiah 55. Or John on Patmos as he's writing the book of Revelation. Like, was he tingling because he was naming it? An other world, kingdom of God, beyond yet here reality. I mean, did Jesus get goosebumps when he told the parable of the vine? There's something about getting your heart and your soul and your mind in line with the way things are that is so, so compelling. I think reporters, journalists, truth tellers touch on that. Elizabeth Renzetti, who I read in an article that she posted two days after I contacted her and she got back to me, said, I have 2,687 emails in my inbox that I haven't got to yet. <laughs> so I was kind of happy that she got to mine and was willing to engage in this question. When I asked her where she found meaning in her work, she said, I would say there are two strands of satisfaction to being a journalist. The first is in the process, and the second is in the outcome. Many people become or stay journalists because they thrive on the daily chase. Deadlines, which are oppressive for a lot of people, are actually a source of pleasure for most journalists. There's a sense of the hunt, of tracking down information that is crucial to your story or that other people don't have. I've never been one of those people who track down scoops, which is what investigative journalists do, and the thrill of the hunt is especially keen for them. And it's a well-known trap for war journalists to become adrenaline junkies who are addicted to bang, bang. Before I read the rest of her answer, I thought, well, thank God for people who are addicted to the point of risking their own lives, their own time, their own whatever, to get to the truth, who care that much about getting the story out or getting to the bottom of things exposing the corruption, revealing the true nature of the tragedy, speaking justice to an injustice, or keeping us aware or even awake. 
I mean, thank God there are people impassioned for that because I don't know about you, but I'm asleep and I'm apathetic and I'm inattentive to what's happening in my world. And yet if all truth is God's truth and God is speaking history and news and what's happening in our world right now is His story, I mean, shouldn't you be as much on the hunt to get to the truth of things as a journalist is? Or a psalmist. God, you're my God. I can't get enough of you. I've worked up such hunger and thirst for God traveling across dry and weary deserts. Elizabeth Renzetti goes on. Then, of course, the second strand of satisfaction is the outcome, which is when your story is printed or airs for the broadcast journalists. There are all kinds of thrills. I was going to write highs, and in some ways, it's also addictive. Seeing your first front-page byline or watching someone on the subway read your story. Amazingly, those thrills don't diminish over time. But equally important is the sense that you're making a difference in the world. Every journalist I know, even the most jaded, would say that A, that's why they got into the business, and B, it's a prime reason they stay. All the corny old ideals hold true, feeling like you're changing things or speaking truth to power, to use a terrible cliché which I think I used earlier in the sermon, right? A woman I know who's been editing for years and just took a senior position says she's constantly amazed at how her young reporters all talk about wanting to make positive change happen with their stories. And if that sounds a bit idealized, we are an idealistic lot. The prophets were an idealistic lot. No one ever got into journalism for the money. For ego, yes, thrills, fun, adventure but also because you do feel like you're not wasting your life doing it. When she wrote about the byline buzz, and when I used to write for the Herald and write for other things, and I go, yeah, I know that buzz, and it's dangerous, pride-wise and ego-wise, but ego aside, there is something very validating about your words being published. I think Deep inside, that's why we love seeing likes on things we post on Facebook, even publishing there. There's something about being heard and having what you say have an impact and seeing and knowing that it has an impact in a world-changing way. I think as human beings, we are all made to feel the goodness of that kind of moment where the word and the work of our lives achieve some intended purpose, our intended, God's intended purpose. We, every one of us, is made in the image of a God whose words are always published and always efficacious. And for all we know, God Himself delights in the fact that that is true. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth, says God. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. All that is has been spoken, is being spoken by God. Are you hungry for the word of the Lord as he speaks it in your world? Are you excited to live it and speak it and proclaim it through, through the life that you're authoring, co-authoring with God? When I asked Nathan Vanderclip what he liked most about journalism, He wrote a beautiful response. He said, I like the feeling of probing something interesting. I like the feeling of understanding something complex. I like the idea of helping illuminate problems. I like ferreting out information that the public doesn't yet know but should. I like meeting people who are different from myself. I like gleaning insights from people who possess creativity, thoughtfulness, and power that exceeds my own. I like the all-too-rare thrill of a sentence that sings. He's being humble if you read his reports. He's just 
so wide-reaching in his perspective for a young journalist and, and, and very eloquent. I like to hear and recount stories that are just plain fascinating. I like it when I get to travel to places. This is where your envy can start to grow, as mine did when I first read this. Travel to places few people get to see, to meet polar bears up close, fly in fighter jets, drive icebreakers, peer out over the North Korean border, or sneak around China's distant Western territories to speak with people about religious persecution. I like it when a story is so good it tells itself. I like it when a story is incredibly tough to tell. But somehow it turns out. As soon as I read that list, I sent him an email back and I said, Nathan, you, I think you image God in most of what you just said there. I think God likes, loves all those things. Interesting stories, illumining problems, exposing hidden information, meeting others, learning from them. The God, that God would let us hold him, raise him, Christ. Writing eloquently, Excited about fascinating stories, seeing all that fills the world face-to-face, -face, up close, loving a story when it tells itself. Loving a story that though even, our, even though our story is so tough to tell, and God must suffer with us in the toughness of the story that's being told. Loving that it somehow, knowing that it somehow will turn out. Surely, God feels this too. Nathan went on to say, and you can hear God's heart pulsing in the rest of his response. Things often feel most right when I'm in an interview where someone is saying something unexpected and meaningful. They also feel right when I arrive in a foreign place and discover stories that have gone untold simply because others haven't come yet, yet come to these places. When I was a reporter in Calgary, I drove the routes of both the Keystone XL and Northern Gateway pipelines. It was a fascinating introduction to the human, ge to, to the human geography of these massive projects, which have important economic and geopolitical ramifications. Hearing the struggles and hopes of ranchers, hunters, doctors, businessmen, educators, artists, politicians, and a long list of others, these trips offered so many moments to gain new understanding of the way people's lives intersect with national imperatives. Equally memorable, he writes, are the moments when it's hard to hold back tears. I'm working on a story right now looking at Chinese second children born outside of the one-child policy. As a result, they are forced to live without state recognition in a country where a national ID card is the basis for virtually all of life education, work, travel, access to state services. I listened to a young girl say she wished she had not been born. I heard a mom, mother, beg me to tell me, beg me to tell people she would offer her son for foreign adoption just so he has a chance to gain a proper education out of fear that she has destroyed his life in China just by having him. It's wrenching. Now tell me he is not imaging the heart of his maker as his heart is broken, as he's passionate to tell that woman's story so that maybe even if that's the right answer, her prayer for her son is answered. You keep track of all my sorrows, God. You've collected all my tears in your bottle. You've recorded each one, reporter God, in your book. Surely God knows that a tough story told eloquently and well can somehow turn out in the end. Surely he knows better than any of us that that is exactly what this tough story at times we're living will be. Only he sees the whole of reality in this universe for what it is, from beginning to end, alpha to omega, with perfect perspicuity, the whole truth and nothing but the truth about all that is. 
Up until last week, I learned two days ago, Mike Zabo, the Reuters reporter, was a Reuters reporter. He said, I'll write my answer as though I was still working for Reuters. And he wrote a long answer about how he loved reporting on environmental issues, and this was a huge passion for him, and saving elephants by writing good stories about the ivory trade and, 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 and how in Europe all of the credits are working regarding you know, reducing greenhouse gas, and just very passionate about our environment. And he said in the course of telling that story that what, what's most meaningful for me is when you're at the big events like UN climate talks and you're writing the story and you know that so much of the world is watching and is going to read what you write. And when I read that phrase, I just thought about how important and weighty you truth-telling can be. I mean, there are truths that have lasting, everlasting effect. Global, eternal, universal implications. And even as there is a big global audience out there for a journalist to potentially connect with, there's an even bigger audience in behind them, a God who sees and records all things. So assuming that Mike was going to let me be his pastor, I don't even know if he's into the God thing or church thing, I asked him why. Why did you leave? And he sent me a whole bunch of links to stories that were already reported, but basically Reuters is shutting down their environmental reporting or a big part of it, and they took the link off their web page, and a whole bunch of people had to change their reporting portfolio, him included. He said, essentially, Reuters decided that climate change wasn't a priority. They dismantled several news services we had on the subject and removed the environment tab from the website. So I sent him a note back, and I said, you know, I'm connecting the whole idea of journalists and prophets, and prophets in the Bible did not get an easy ride. You know, Jeremiah's calling was, you're going to get a calling to speak truth to people. No one's going to listen to you, Jeremiah. You know, your position on the environment and science and all that aside pretty tough to have your voice muted or taken away. Jesus was crucified for truth-telling about a spiritually environmental issue, the kingdom of God, for speaking an empire-threatening truth. He was killed, and now that truth is being followed by billions of people. Journalists unpack the story we're living and illumine the reality that we are living, a reality that we all need to know about. They tell us why and how and where and when things are so that you can know, know where and why and how and who you are. When the skeptical, post-resurrection, cynical, very much journalistic and reporter-like Doubting Thomas asked Jesus for life direction, Jesus said these words, I am the way and the truth and the life. If you follow me, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Let's pray. Not a thing in this world was made apart from you, Jesus. Everything that is was mediated, arranged, conceived of, a thought in the mind of you. Your heavenly Father, energized and enlivened by the Holy Spirit, all things through you and for you and for your glory. And one day we'll see it clearly and the mystery will fade away and the pain and the tears will be wiped away and we'll get it. We'll get it completely. Help us to see that that is where the story is going now. That this is that story. That that's the conclusion of now. Whatever struggle or or bad part of the narrative we're living now or joy that we're living now, that one day all of it 
gets retold or newly told from a different angle, from a kingdom perspective, and will be perfect, a perfect conclusion, an eternal ending, an eternal telling of our lives. In the quiet, help us to hear your heart beating as you hold your world, your universe. With every thought, help us attend to the mind of God beyond our comprehension, conceiving it all. With humble, broken, dependent, needing hearts, help us to hear your call. I am the tr- I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and to follow you, and to find life, and to maybe for the first time in our lives or the first time in a long time, get in the zone of our wills in tune with yours, our lives uh, at, the, at the tip of your pen. Everything, all things held by you, for you, for your glory. Help us see that, know that. We pray in your name, Jesus, in the name of our Heavenly Father, in the name of the Holy Spirit, amen.